Hi, I'm Jackie Stapleton and welcome to Atoll TV. Today I'm here to help you with understanding the requirements of ISO 45001. If you like this video and want to see more great content, then click the subscribe button and the bell icon. It costs nothing to subscribe and you can unsubscribe at any time. In this video, I'm going to cover clause 5.1, leadership and commitment. I'm going to break this clause down and turn it into something you can all understand. You'll then be able to apply this to your own organization system and understand what the requirements will look like for you. No more guessing. Keep on watching as I can show you just how easy this is. Okay, let's get started. Clause 5.1, leadership and commitment is the first clause under section five, leadership and worker participation. There are quite a few different elements to this clause, so I will break them down into smaller chunks and explain each part as I go. Before I do this though, I do want to share with you what it would look like auditing the requirements for this clause. For me personally, I do not sit down and go through these requirements one by one and look for evidence through interview with top management. A lot of the requirements in this clause you will come across throughout the duration of the complete audit. There are areas that you will observe, listen to, collect evidence on that will all point back to these requirements without you specifically making your way through them one by one. If you are building a system, please also be aware of this. There are other clauses you can conform with that will automatically meet these requirements. So there is no double up. I'll explain this to you for each section as I go. Right, now let's get started. Each separate requirement in this clause starts off with a statement of top management shall demonstrate leadership and commitment with respect to the OHS management system by. And then it lists the various ways in which this leadership and commitment is to be demonstrated. So that you don't have to listen to me repeat myself over and over again, I'm going to now assume that you know that each section that I cover is referring to how leadership and commitment is to be demonstrated with respect to the OHS management system by top management. And actually, it is probably a good idea right about now to explain to you who on earth top management is. The official definition for top management is the person or group of people who directs and controls an organization at the highest level. I always say that top management are the decision makers. Depending on the structure and size of the business, top management could be the owners, shareholders, board of directors, general manager, or even a project manager if the scope of the system is down to a project level only. Great, I'm glad I got that out of the way. We can really get started now. So point A states, taking overall responsibility and accountability for the prevention of work-related injury and ill health, as well as the provision of safe and healthy workplaces and activities. Yep. That's right, top management is ultimately responsible and accountable for the prevention of work-related injury and ill health by providing a safe and healthy workplace. This means that even though top management can delegate or assign certain responsibilities to others, they are still accountable for it. The buck stops with them. Point B states, ensuring that the OHS policy and related OHS objectives are established and are compatible with the strategic direction of the organization. Easy, OHS policy requirements are stated at clause 5.2 and OHS objective requirements are stated at clause 6.2. Make sure that top management has been involved in the establishment of both the policy and the objectives. And most importantly, that they align with the strategic plan of the business. 
These are not to sit in a corner separate from the strategic direction of the business. If the requirements are met in clause 5.2 and 6.2, then it's a nice tick back here too. Point C states, ensuring the integration of the OHS management system requirements into the organization's business processes. I love this one. An OHS management system isn't something that is built separately to the business and it sits over there in a corner gathering dust. The OHS management system needs to be integrated into the day to day processes so that OHS is just the way you do business. You will know how well this is implemented when you're interviewing employees and they are showing you their processes that they follow to ensure that they and other workers remain safe and healthy at all times. Point D states, ensuring that the resources needed to establish, implement, maintain and improve the OHS management system are available. That's right, top management can't use the excuse that we don't have enough staff to maintain the OHS management system. Believe me, it's a common excuse given for any gaps that might show up. And look, I get it, it could definitely be the case. However, here it is clearly stated that it is up to top management to ensure that resources are available. It's right here in black and white. Don't forget that resources are not just people. They can be plant, equipment, hardware and software too. Then point E states, communicating the importance of effective OHS management and of conforming to the OHS management system requirements. It appears as though it is up to top management to communicate to everyone information about the OHS management system, what it means to the business, and what it means to workers with regards to following the system. What a great opportunity to engage with workers and really get them involved in the system, not only in understanding the requirements, but also in providing feedback and improving the system. Point F states, ensuring that the OHS management system achieves its intended results. And this means that top management should be monitoring what they planned to achieve. They might do this by monitoring objective set, investigating incidents, or reviewing non-conformances and corrective actions. Point G states, directing and supporting persons to contribute to the effectiveness of the OHS management system. I sort of mentioned this one a bit earlier when I was referring to communicating the importance of effective OHS management and of conforming to the OHS management system. Any communication and interaction that top management have, they should be demonstrating in a positive manner what the OHS management system is all about and getting people involved in the process. Point H states, ensuring and promoting continual improvement. I like that word promoting. This is all about actively encouraging the team to keep an eye out for improvements, building a culture where your workers are not too scared to put their hand up to say that something isn't working out the best way that it can and putting forward solutions. This attitude and culture really does need to come from the top. Point I states, supporting other relevant management roles to demonstrate their leadership as it applies to their areas of responsibility. This is great. What better way to build a positive culture around OHS than to give other management roles leadership responsibilities to promote the OHS management system. This really shows that the system is to trickle through all of the relevant functions and levels of the business giving people at different levels, areas of leadership and engagement. 
Point J states developing, leading and promoting a culture in the organization that supports the intended outcomes of the OHS management system. Essentially, it is up to top management to lead the way, set the example when it comes to the OHS management system and the intended outcomes. It starts from the top. You will identify the OHS culture of the organization throughout your audit by what you observe and the responses from auditees. Is the business well resourced to identify, assess, and control OHS hazards and risks? Are all workers aware of the OHS system and related procedures? How are they involved in the system? What is their attitude towards OHS for themselves and their workmates? While I've referred to workers here, I want to make it clear that I'm not saying it's up to the worker, not at all. I'm simply demonstrating that you can normally identify the level of leadership and OHS culture within the organization by observing and interviewing all levels of workers in the business. Now, point K states, protecting workers from reprisals when reporting incidents, hazards, risks, and opportunities. Top management in their leadership must ensure that the OHS culture that they establish support workers to come forward to report incidents, near misses, hazards, risks, and opportunities for improvement. Workers mustn't feel like there will be consequences if they do come forward. The culture should be that of open communication, continual learning and improvement, always with the intent of keeping everyone safe. Point L states, ensuring the organization establishes and implements a process or processes for consultation and participation of workers. This requirement also relates to Clause 5.4, Consultation and Participation of Workers. If Clause 5.4 is being met, then this requirement is being met back here in Clause 5.1. Remembering though that it is top management who is to demonstrate their leadership and commitment when it comes to consultation and participation. It's not something where the responsibility and accountability can be delegated. Now that I've explained all of these requirements, can you see more clearly how you would determine conformance to this clause by the results of your entire audit or review of your system? There are so many links and parallels to these requirements and not all of them are easily determined in a straight out interview with top management. You need to be able to walk around ask questions of different workers at different levels to truly see how top management is demonstrating their leadership and commitment to the OHS management system. Thank you so much for joining me and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Auditor Training Online is a recognized training provider and we know how it works in the real world. So we are confident that we can help you to make a change in your life and join the most sought after profession out there. Go to our website and enroll in our training to transform your work and industry experience into a recognized qualification and career. And also, don't forget to subscribe to Atoll TV and leave a comment or question as I truly do want to help you to join the best career out there with me.